happy new year all the best for 2021 right uh, so i hope all of you will uh, make sure that you all will complete your exams this year uh, just make sure you don't carry it forward any further and not beyond 2021 right worst case you will finish it off in 2021 nothing beyond that because you have already lost one year and uh, there is a lot of ground for you all to cover now this shows the importance of finishing off an exam or not delaying anything in life anything right don't delay anything in life uh, now there might be some of you who probably had an opportunity to complete banking exams in 2019 2019 september and uh, for some reason you may have opted to uh, <clears throat> postpone by another 6 months right you would have thought you can complete in uh, 2020 march but that would have been a very big, big mistake as you would now have noticed right if you you have already lost one year one year just washed out because of covid i had you completed last year uh, in 2019 by now you would have been uh, free of one headache one headache less right no more exams bank no more banking exams perhaps you could have focused on something uh, another exam right uh, right and so far you have lost one year now what if you come down in uh, the exam that you left for later because it's been one and a half years since you last studied uh, you have to get going from scratch right uh, you have to refresh so many things things are not fresh in your mind uh, lots of things needs to fall in place and uh, so after you're taking an exam after a long time lots of things can go wrong and you have to get yourselves back in the mood in the trend uh, just make sure you all finish it this time right okay what's gone is gone we need to move forward so just make sure you don't carry anything beyond 2021 right uh, i would strongly advise all of you to try and finish off all the exam all the subjects that you all have pending in one go to all seven in one go because you have already lost a lot of time and a uh, lot of ground to cover a right? lot of catching up to do okay so there because time doesn't stop although you stop uh, so you need to keep up right so good luck all the best for 2021 let's make sure you we get through all the exams this year right so last week or about two weeks back before the holiday before christmas uh, we covered the types of funds uh, we did uh, open ended funds and closed ended funds we did the differences between open ended and closed ended and we talked about unlimited capitalization dealing directly with the fund itself in when it comes to open ended funds uh then the unit price being based on net value of share uh whereas in closed ended funds it was based on demand and supply price was based on demand and supply capitalization is limited and you deal in the secondary market once the, the shares the, the units are listed right the limited hedge funds which are open for uh, financially sophisticated high net worth investors right and finally we also did uh, pension funds sovereign wealth funds right and uh, today we will move on so any questions from last week
No questions? Fine. Right, so let's start off with uh, fundraising instruments. Okay. A couple of weeks back, we covered uh, equity. Right. We did the ordinary shares, preference shares. Now, this is required when you need to uh, raise funds. Uh, for various activities. Say, for example, uh, you need to raise funds for an expansion, right? Uh, if you need to expand your operations, you need to uh, get into a, 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 a new venture, right? Now, for example, about uh, couple of weeks back, we saw uh, Brown's group of, well, Brown's uh, uh, group company of LLC purchasing Serendip hotels. So that was a 750 million rupee transaction. <clears throat> now, 750 million rupees uh, is additional money which they would have required for the purchase, right? So there are so many things they could have done to raise this money. How could they have done it? What are your thoughts before we get into the subject matter? If you all were the directors of Browns, how would you have funded this purchase? And what are the things you would have looked at before you got into the, the actual funding? Can you all come up with some points? What are the things you would have considered before you made the funding funding decision? Right, uh, let's not think business, not think anything complicated. How about something much more simpler? Um, say you are trying, looking to put up a house, right? Or to buy a car. What are things you would look at before you decide how to fund it? Let's say it will cost you 10 million bucks. What? are the things you will consider before you make your funding decision. What will you look at? Yes, can you all come up with some points?
networks of the company. And for example, John Kills might look at things differently than maybe a smaller company. That would point. Then the cost. What would be the total cost and additional costs like legal fees, stamp duties, and all that? Uh, return and risk, yeah, why not? Very fine. Return and risk, let me see if you see look at. What about the time duration? Uh, are you looking at short term, long term? What is the time period, uh, whether it's short term or long term? Anything else? That's it. What about collateral? Collateral requirements. Whether you can borrow clean or is collateral required? What else? Yes. Regulatory or uh, statutory. Requirements. For example, banks can't raise funds through commercial paper. Right? If they have short term funding it, it cannot be done through commercial papers. What about the terms and conditions? Terms and conditions. Okay. Then Source things like KYC, reliability, accessibility,
time can be the duration of project. Or even the urgency. How soon do you need the money? Right? So these are some of the things that you need to look at when you get into funding decisions. Uh, and over the last couple of weeks, we discussed certain things, certain instruments you can use, like uh, equity. You can raise funds through equity. And so it can be debt funded or equity funded. Debt funded or equity funded. Uh, I think we discussed that if it's uh, debt funded, the risk of performance is with the borrower or the lender. If a project is debt funded, the risk of performance is with the uh, it's actually with the borrower right regardless of the project's performance the lender will have to sorry then the borrower will have to keep servicing the debt whereas if it's equity funded if the project is not doing well the lender is taking the risk because he doesn't get any return. Isn't it? So all these factors need to be looked at. I will start off with global depository receipts. Now, global deposit receipts are applicable if uh, a, uh, a certain company has exhausted all the borrowing resources it has within a country. That if you have exhausted all the resources you have in a certain country or jurisdiction, uh, jurisdiction then you will have to go overseas and borrow. That's called foreign through and uh, global depository receipt. Now you can raise funds for your organization in a global or a GDR, global deposit receipt. Uh, in fact, uh, it's like a share being listed over, <coughs> overseas. A share is being listed overseas. Now in Sri Lanka, <coughs> HNB and John Kills have got themselves listed overseas. Overseas stock exchanges <clears throat> through Google deposit receipts. The certificates that represent an ownership interest in an ordinary share of a company, but that are marketed outside the company's home country to increase its visibility in the world market <clears throat> and to access a great amount of investment capital in other countries. Okay, so it represents ownership interest in ordinary shares of a company. Okay, so remember, GDR or Global Deposit Receipts are formed <coughs> by uh, through ordinary shares of a company. Deposit receipts are structured to resemble typical stocks on the exchange that they trade so that foreigners can buy an interest in the company without worrying about differences in the currency, accounting practices, or language barriers to be concerned about the other risk in investing in foreign stocks directly. Now, just assume that uh, John Keats was had not issued GDR. They had not issued global deposit receipts and that they were only listed in the Colombo Stock Exchange. Now, if that was the case, and if uh, John Keyes wanted to raise funds, they will have to wait for foreigners to come to Sri Lanka and invest. Now, when the foreigner comes to Sri Lanka and invests, he is not may not be familiar with the country. 
right? Uh, Sri Lanka, he may not have heard of the country, or the language may be different, culture might be different. He may have talked to brokers whom he has not met or dealt before. Right? New transaction, uh, new relationships will have to be established. Then accounting practices might be different. <clears throat> So many things to be looked at. Whereas if it's a global deposit receipt, uh, then the investor might be a lot more familiar, right? There's uh, John Keels was listed in, uh, and uh, John Keels and HNB, they were listed in the Luxembourg exchange. Right? So, uh, investors are a lot more familiar with Luxembourg than Sri Lanka. And uh, it's closer to them at heart. And they're investing in, one of the major currencies, uh, dollars. Right. Uh, so the currency is also much more familiar. They, it's easy for a foreigner to follow uh, the major currency movements rather than the smaller currency movements, right? The Sri Lankan rupee is not a very liquid currency for them to hedge. They don't have too many hedging tools and all that. So with all these complications, uh, all the, most of these complications are addressed if they invest in GDR. And if John Hills has listed uh, in GDRs, addressed GDR, then the name of John Hills is, will sound a lot more familiar to foreign investors, right? They have a global presence also amongst investors. So if foreigners do come to Sri Lanka, if, when they when they come to Sri Lanka, they will look at the companies that are on offer. And when they see John Keels or HNB, they will, it will look familiar to them. And so John Keels and HNB will find it a lot more easier uh, to raise funds and attract investments in this manner. Uh, so deposit receipts are structured to resemble typical stocks on exchanges that they are trade that they trade so that foreigners can buy an interest in the company without worrying about differences in currency, accounting practices or language barriers, or be concerned about <clears throat> the other risk in investing in foreign stocks directly. Right now, uh, global deposit receipt is a derivative of what we call American deposit receipt. Right? So the, the difference is American deposit receipt, the company has to be listed within America, within the US. Uh, uh, a foreign company or a company outside the US being listed in the US is called American deposit receipt. Were the first deposit receipts issued by JP Morgan uh, in 1927. Right? So you don't have to know the history, this is just for your knowledge. ADRs allowed companies domiciled outside the US to tap the United States capital markets. And so companies that were domiciled outside the US were able to tap the capital markets in the US. American deposit receipts were structured to resemble other stocks on the American exchanges with comparable prices per share, shareholder notifications in English, and the use of the United States currency for sale and purchase of ADR and for dividend payments. A GDR is similar to ADR, but it's a deposit receipt sold outside US and outside the home country of the issuing company. Right. So remember, they're similar, but uh, GDR is sold outside US and outside the country of the issuing company. So if John Keels is raising a GDR, it will not be listed in the US, it will not be listed in Sri Lanka, right? In a third party country. Most GDRs are regardless of their geographic market denominated in US dollars, although some trade in euros or British pounds. There are more than 900 GDRs on listed exchanges on worldwide, uh, on exchanges worldwide, with more than 2,900 issuers from 80 different countries. Right? <clears throat> so that's for knowledge purposes. But you should know the difference between a GDR and the ADR and why a GDR or ADR is used. So let's quickly try this example. Can you all go through this example?
So take John Keels, for example, which trades on CSE at a price of around 2,000, right? And this hypothetical numbers <clears throat> is equivalent to $20, assuming uh, that the exchange rate is 100, right? So if the exchange rate is 100, the price of John Keels, which is mentioned as 2,000, is going at 20. Now, US bank purchases 10,000 shares of John Keels and issues them in US in the ratio of 10 is to 1. Right, so this is in fact an ADR because it is issued in the US. 10 is to 1 meaning 10, uh, total of 10,000 shares of John Keels has been purchased and uh, 10 shares combined to 1 ADR. Right, So each ADR will have 10 shares of John Keels. This means each ADR purchased is worth 10 John Keels shares. So if each is worth $20, 10 shares will be worth $200. So one ADR will be priced at $200. Once ADRs are priced and sold, it, it subsequent, its subsequent price is determined by supply and demand factors, like any ordinary share. Right, so beyond this, it is demand and supply. Preference shares we have already covered. We have uh, cumulative preference shares, non-cumulative preference shares. Redeemable and irredeemable preference shares. Company stocks with dividends that are paid to shareholders before common stock dividends are paid out, right? So that is the main thing about preference shares in, in terms of dividend payments or liquidation. Preference shareholders get priority over ordinary shareholders. In the event of a company going bankrupt, preferred shareholders have the right to be paid company assets first. Preference shares typically pay a fixed dividend, whereas common shares do not pay a fixed dividend. And unlike common shareholders, preference shareholders usually do not have voting rights. Right? So these are the main differences. Preference shares don't have voting rights, ordinary shares do have. Preference shares will pay a fixed dividend, common shares, there is no such thing. Advantages, there will be a loss of control, not be a lot, sorry, there will not be a loss of control within the company because preference shareholders do not have voting rights. So in, for the ordinary shareholders, uh, it wouldn't matter because preference shareholders do not have voting rights. It can be raised for a specific time at the end of which it can be repaid. Right? After, thereafter, the company need not pay the preference dividend. So once preference shares are settled, you don't have to pay preference dividends. The risk of financing will be less when compared to updating a loan. Uh, when compared to obtaining a loan, I'm sorry. Risk of financing will be less when compared to obtaining a loan because the preference dividends will be less, will be paid only if distributable profits are available. By taking a term loan, security needs to be given to the financial institution in the form of <clears throat> primary security and collateral security. There are no such requirements and therefore the company gets the required money and the assets also remain free of any kind of charge on them. So there is no collateral requirement. Uh, disadvantage, it's a costly source of finance, raising shares, whether it's ordinary shares or preference shares, it's not an easy exercise. It costs a lot of money and time. The interest on debt is a tax deductible expense, whereas the dividend of preference shares is paid out of divisible profits of the company. Skipping dividends, disregard, uh, will, well, your, your reputation can get damaged if you don't pay dividends. <clears throat> then commercial papers, uh, these are short-term instruments, short-term notes issued by large, strong companies. 
commercial paper stayed in the market at rates just above TB rates. It's a, the government raises funds through short term instrument, it is called commercial paper. If the government raises funds through short term instrument, they are called treasury bills. Commercial paper is bought with surplus cash by banks and other companies. Debentures. This is the equivalent of bonds issued by governments. If a corporate issues a, uh, an instrument which is longer than one year, it is called a debenture instead of a bond in the case of a government. And treasury bills in the case of a government are called commercial paper when it comes to uh, corporates. Bonds that are not secured by specific property or collateral. Instead, they are backed up, <clears throat> backed by the full faith and credit of the issuer. And bondholders have a general claim on assets that are not pledged to other debtors, other debt. Convertible debentures, we discussed last week. This is where at maturity a debenture gets converted <coughs> the option of converting an, an ordinary debenture into equity. Right. I explained the convertible debentures last week. Hope you all can remember. Convertible debentures or bonds are originally issued and classified as bonds, but have the option to convert into a fixed number of issuers' common shares and can be thought of as bonds with call options attached. Right? So this is what you need to remember. Convertible debentures are bonds with call options attached. The conversion ratio, which is usually based on the number of shares per 100, is determined at the time of issuance. Convertible debentures are hybrid securities, which offer advantages of both bonds and equity. Like ordinary bonds, they offer regular interest income through coupon payments and a degree of downside protection not found in equity. Right, so remember, convertible debentures are like hybrid securities. They have features of both equity and bonds. Because if it gets converted into equity, then it will be like shares. But uh, if it doesn't get converted, it will remain like a bond. Like ordinary bonds, they offer regular interest income through coupon payments and a degree of downside protection not found in equity. Right? Because if the price falls at maturity, the market price of the security is down, you can decide whether you want to convert it into uh, equity or to let it mature as a bond. Right? So if the price is very low, then you will go as a bond. Otherwise, uh, you will let it continue as equity. Uh, it's something like this. I will explain very quickly. This is already what we discussed last week.
this the debenture plus all options. Gives you convertible dimension. So the debenture will be price, let's say, 100, all option is 10. Then your convertible debenture will be priced at 110. Now, what happens is if this debenture is a five year debenture. After five years, the debenture matures. Now, when it matures, what the issuer will say is two debentures can be converted into one share. And let's assume this is talking about John Lewis. Two debentures can be combined and converted into a share. So this is a two is one debenture. Two debentures can be converted into one share. Now two debentures is two into debenture price is hundred <coughs> and be converted into one share. Right. So my question is, for you to convert it into a share, what should the price of a, what can you say about the price of the share? If you are going to convert it into a share, what can you say about the price of a share? If you decide to convert it into shares, what should be the price of the share? What do you think? At what price will you get converted into shares? What will be the price of a share if you are going to convert these debentures into shares? Any idea? Now the face value of a share is upper debenture is 100, right? So the option is to convert two debentures into one share. Now you will prefer to convert it into shares if the price of a share is what? You will want to convert two debentures into one share if the price of a share is how much? What can you say about it?
Understood? So the conversion price should be less than the market price for you to convert it into shares. Otherwise, it is not worth it. <clears throat> if you can Sorry, uh, so if you don't convert, if you let, it go, let these go as debentures, then they will look purely like debentures. Right? But if you convert them into shares, for five years they will remain like debentures. But at maturity, they have features of equity. And they get converted into ordinary shares, you will have voting rights, all that will be there. Clear? Yeah, is this understood? Clear? <clears throat> so the advantages to the issuer how will the issuer benefit? Now, advantages to the lender is he can convert into shares if the price is right. But advantages to the issuer. Now, let's assume this is a five-year debenture going at 10%. And that means every year interest will come to 10 bucks. 10 rupees of interest. See? So when the debenture is initially issued, the issuer will get the debenture price plus the price of the call option. So effectively he is raising funds not at 10 but at 9. So his borrowing cost can be reduced. Borrowing cost can be reduced. Nine. Okay, so that is the benefit of the issuer. Attractive financing vehicle for an issuer as they provide a cheaper way to raise permanent capital. The benefit to selling convertible bonds is a reduced cash interest payment. Issuer is effectively selling a call option to, on their common stock to allow for she, uh, cheaper cost of funding. Convertibles also offer tax advantages to the issuer as fixed interest payments are tax deductible. Right, so that means uh, unlike equity, where dividends are not tax deductible, uh, fixed income cost expenses incurred on fixed income like interest payments 
finance cost, interest payments, interest paid can be deducted for tax. Cost to the issuer, the cost of having a lower interest expense is the potential dilution of shareholders equity caused by exercising the conversion feature. Let's say if it is exercise, if the conversion feature is exercise, uh, shareholders equity can get diluted. Leverage buyout. Right? So leverage buyout is where you borrow and raise funds. The acquisition of another big company, another company using a significant amount of borrowed money, bonds or loans to meet the cost of acquisition. Right? So the bulk is funded through borrowings. Now, for example, <coughs> how did uh, how did Haley's buy Singer? It was through borrowings. Uh, through HNB. Oh, I think it was it NSB, one of the two. Right? So Haley's bought Singer through a leverage buyout. Then Softlogic purchased uh, what? Odell? Again, a leverage buyout. It was on 3 billion loan. I think it was from HNB. Often the assets of the company being acquired are used as collateral for the loan in addition to assets of the acquiring company. So the acquiree's assets will be used as collateral. The purpose of leverage buyout is to allow companies to make large acquisitions without having to commit a lot of capital. <coughs> right. So what happens is if, for example, the cost is 10 billion, one company might just put in 1 billion of their own capital and the less 9 billion will come from borrowings. That's called leverage buyout. Securitization is the process of pooling together a group of receivables from financial assets and issuing a fixed income instrument to investors based on the strength of the future stream of cash flows. So securitization. This is where the process where, uh, let's say, for example, uh, if you take a balance sheet, If you take a balance sheet of a bank or a finance company, on the asset side, you will see you may have housing loans. Personal loans. Then you might have credit cards. Portfolios, huh? Owning. Leasing. Portfolios. And amongst leasing, you might have maybe motorbikes. Trailers. What you do in securitization is you take one pool of asset, one asset class, and transfer it to what is called a special purpose paper. 
special purpose vehicle. Now the custodian of this asset class is with the special purpose vehicle. So what it does is, uh, it will use this portfolio of assets, this pool of assets, and it as security and give it away to investors. It's not actually security, but uh, what they will say is they have a certain asset, a debt instrument, which can be settled through cash flows received from housing loans. And if you are interested in investing, you may invest. Right? So you don't get ownership, the investor will not get ownership of the housing loans, but he will invest in commercial paper. Right? So the cash flows. For this investment, let's say it's 100 million investment, it's made uh, the 100 million investment is honored by the special purpose vehicle using cash flow generated from the housing loan. Investors will give funds and the funds will be rooted to the Yes. Special purpose vehicle will be arranged, right? So debt servicing, the housing loan installment payments will come to the special purpose vehicle. Using that, will he will fund. Uh, then service. Okay. That is how a securitization process works. It is the process of pulling together groups of receivables from, from financial assets. So you are looking together groups of receivables from financial assets. And issuing a fixed income instrument to investors based on strength of future stream of cash flows. So there can be an original borrower uh, who will uh, go to the originator. In this case, the, the originator is the finance company. And the finance company. Uh, will sell the asset class to the special purpose vehicle and the borrower will give cash flows to the special purpose vehicle. Special purpose vehicle will uh, give this issue the securities to investors who will give them the funds, right? So whatever the, the money that is collected is circulated and recycled in this manner. Eligible cash flows for securitization can be contractual or non-contractual. Contractuals are like lease rentals, high purchase, uh, building rent receivables. Right? That's where you know exactly how much you're getting the next month. Those are called contractual cash flows. So they are lease rentals, high purchase, building rent receivables, housing loan receivables, personal loan receivables. These are the kind of cash flows where you know how much of money you're going to get next month. Right? So it's uh, if you take a, a personal loan or a housing loan, the installment is fixed. And the lender will have a reasonable idea that you're going to receive it. The non-contractual cash flows, that is where you're uncertain how much you're going to receive next month. Right? It can be higher than the previous month or even lower. 
QTT receivables from brokers, credit card receivables, school fees, utility payment and rates, uh, toll collections. Its advantages of securitization is uh, it en enhances liquidity of the organization. What else? It generates additional liquidity for lending. Disadvantage, well, another advantage is uh, the, the borrower is uh, already allocating certain assets in order to repay the loan. Right? He has a funding plan, so investors can take comfort in that. Disadvantages, yeah, anything? Disadvantages of securitization. It is a long drawn process. It takes time, consumes a lot of time and money to get it in order. Parties to a securitization transaction. You can have structuring agents, trustees, or escrow. Lawyers, auditors, the trust certificates. Very unlikely that you will get tested on this area. Right. And the trust pays cash. It's very similar to a securitization, except that a trust is involved. So, in a trust, the investors pay cash and buy the trust certificate. Then the trust issues trust certificates. Servicing trust certificates, just for information, you need not study. Documents that you may require are board resolutions, trust deeds, mortgage bonds, power of attorneys, trust certificates. So it's a long drawn process. Credit enhancements. And how can you enhance a credit? Now, for example, uh, some of the companies in our country, which may have been worth Rather than worth, which may have had a, a credit rating, let's say of triple B plus, right? So they have a triple B plus credit rating, and if they borrow locally, they can borrow at, uh, let's assume, ten percent, right? That's uh, about PLR plus four percent. So there is a company borrowing at PLR plus four percent rated triple B. Now, what they can do if they realize that their borrowing cost can be reduced, uh, what they can do is try and get a rating upgrade, right? From triple B plus, if they can get to double A plus, that would be fantastic. Some of the option available would be to uh, get a guarantee. From maybe the parent that uh, in case of an emergency, yeah. 
or, or they can uh, from the parent company or even a bank guarantee or they can get an external third party to guarantee the credit that they made. That's called credit enhancements. You know credit enhancements anyway. Right. So minimizing risks to the investors. If the issuing company pays and the lessee pays, there is no risk. If the issuing company pays, lessee does not pay, then you replace the loans. If the issuing company does not pay, lessee pays, you need to use your power of attorney. Right. Uh, this is only for information. You don't have to study. Documents that are required can be information memorandum, board of directors, senior management, key shareholders, financial stability, repayment capacity, industry analysis, internal system for checking, feasibility of legal documents, quality of loan portfolio, non-smoking staff. Sorry, uh, quality of the loan portfolio. Non-performing analysis. Uh, provisioning policy of the company. Feasibility of legal documents, all these, right? The, the standard documents that you will require. <clears throat> rating report. Now, this is also a costly exercise. Uh, rating report. Not every company can afford to do it. Uh, so you'll have to hire rating agencies to do it specifically for you. Can be quite a tedious process. Expensive. They will ask all sorts of questions. Right. Uh, so that is it in terms of fundraising instruments. They are already called covered equity. Um, any questions on this? Yeah, any questions? No questions? That is the case, we can move on to the next area. Give me one more minute to ask any question.
Yeah, so you can get tested. They will just ask you write short descriptions of uh, some of the products like uh, what commercial papers are, what a GDR is. So it can be a short explanatory question. You might have to define some of these products. What a securitization is, things like that. Right, any further questions? Okay, so this area you need to read. So if that's it, we can move on to the next area, which is on working capital. So the next day is on working capital management. Okay, so my question to you is, what is working capital? What do you mean by working capital? What is working capital?
So when it says it's funded requirements need for day-to-day -day business needs, okay? Yeah, working capital is basically the current assets minus current liabilities. Current assets minus current liabilities. It's working capital. Very simple definition. So, what are current assets and what are current liabilities? What are current assets and what are current liabilities? Stocks, cash in hand, are current assets. Okay. Yeah, receivables. Good. like this now uh, if let's say you have total net worth of 100 million right total net worth you have 100 million so you feel that the price of land will increase and you invest the entire 100 million in land and nothing else but land you don't have a cent other than land, right? So, 100% invested in land. Now, if you want to buy a loaf of bread, how can you buy? You will have to sell part of your land by bread. But how long will it take? It can take months. Okay. That is because land cannot be converted into another type of asset. Not immediately, but yeah. Um, if you have 100 million in cash right, and uh, you go to bed with the 100 million and tuck it in your pillow, then if you want to buy a loaf of bread, no issue at all. Huh? And you can just produce it and buy a loaf of bread. But if you have, or if you have shares, Maybe you can sell some of your shares and you can buy a loaf of bread. Right. So that kind of asset can be converted very quickly into another type of asset. One asset can get converted to another type of asset very fast. Okay. So the convertibility of an asset into another asset and the ease of conversion will determine whether you are holding on to a current asset or a non-current asset. Non-current asset or a current asset. Right. Now, even in your case, what I mentioned earlier, uh, 2021, you should make sure that you complete your banking exams. Don't drag it for next year also. As I said, you should not become fixed assets to the banking institute.
Yes, sir. Uh, you're right. Short term loans, accrued expenses are current liability. So current liabilities are liabilities uh, which are short-term nature and will be settled over the next one year or so. As you all, you guys rightly said, this includes cash, stocks, receivables, maybe short term investments. Right. So, what do you think is best to have uh, maximum possible current assets, minimum possible current liabilities, so that your working capital is maximum? Is it? What is your take on that? What is the best position to be in? Should you try and maximize your working capital or minimize your working capital? Two to one. Okay. Yes, you're right. Because if you are trying to maximize your working capital, that means you should try and increase current assets, reduce current liabilities. Okay. So if you try and increase your current assets, you'll be investing more in cash, maybe letters, stocks, receivables, and all that. that happens, you will end up tying up a lot of cash in maybe your invent or in cash, in cash form itself. So if you have, let's say, the entire working capital in cash, the return you generate is going to be zero. And it will not generate you any return. Then stocks, if you're holding one year stock requirement, One year stock requirement at any given time, if you're holding, then your holding cost on equity, on, on share, on, on stocks, or your inventory is going to be very high. And so you need to strike a balance. How do you strike a balance? That is what we are going to learn today. And uh, this, 
the more inventory you have, your cash is going to be tied up in it. You could have used it elsewhere in something productive, but you're not doing it. You're investing 100% in uh, some stock, right? Or inventory. If that is the case, your money is going to be idling. It's not adding any value to you, right? Once you buy share stocks, the stocks meaning inventory, you'll have to store it somewhere, right? So storage cost comes in. Then you might have to insure it. There can be wastage. Uh, you might have to put security to monitor it. And so lots of terrible expenses come into play. So it's going to eat into your pockets. Meaning the objective should be to try and manage it at the right level. Not too much, not too little. Now take for example, companies like Toyota. How much of inventory do you have to maintain? What amount of inventory does you have to maintain? Toyota maintains inventory of almost zero, near zero, right? They only get uh, components if there is a need. And at the right time, they don't bring in advance and keep it sold somewhere. And so they the practice what we call JIT, just in time. You all have heard of this. A zero inventory. No inventory at all. Just in time. Inventory will arrive just in time for it to be fitted somewhere. It will not arrive in advance. Now, for Toyota to practice this, they should have very strong links to their suppliers. And the supplier should also be very mindful of Toyota's needs. Slightest thing goes wrong, the supply is going to be in trouble, or Toyota will be in trouble from their customers. So they practice just in time, it has helped them save lots of cost. Unbelievable amount of cost has been saved by Toyota. Working capital is the capital of a business which is used in its day-to-day -day trading operations. Simply the current assets used in operations. Working capital is defined as current assets minus current liabilities. So remember the definition. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. The current ratio. Current assets divided by current liabilities indicates whether a company has enough short-term assets to cover its short-term debt. And so current ratio indicates whether the company has enough short-term assets to cover short-term debt. And so this is a very important ratio. You need to know this ratio. Current ratio, current assets divided by current liabilities. It can get tested at the exam. Now, very simple things get tested at your exam. Huh? Uh, they might ask, define working capital. So it's very simply current assets minus current liabilities. It's not difficult, is it? Then the current ratio, current assets divided by current liabilities. And if the current ratio is less than one,
hard assets or current liabilities, right? So ideally, your current ratio should be less than two, but more than one. Between one and two. Right? So if it's less than one, that means you have uh, This means you have less current assets than current liabilities. You have more current liabilities than current assets. If that happens, you might get stuck. You might not be able to perform your day to day duties, right? like uh, paying your <clears throat> utility bills, your salaries, rent, all that might get stuck if this is the case. If you have more current liabilities than current assets. But if it's too high, that means you have a lot of money tied up in idle assets, assets that generate very little return. So you should try and maintain a current ratio between one and two, not more than two, not less than one, somewhere in between. Anything below one indicates negative working capital, right? So your working capital will be negative if you have less than one. Anything over two means that the company is not investing excess assets. Most believe that ratio between 1.2 and 2 is sufficient. Something between 1.2 and 2 is the ideal thing. Uh, working capital management is a managerial accounting strategy focusing on maintaining efficient levels of both components of working capital. Current assets and current liabilities in respect to each other. This ensures the company has sufficient cash flows in order to meet its short term debt obligations and operating expenses. Right? So it should have sufficient cash flows to meet short term debt obligations and operating expenses. Implementing an effective working capital management system is an excellent way for many companies to improve their earnings. Two main aspects of working capital management are ratio analysis, management of individual components of working capital. Right, so important point. You can do ratio analysis and individual components of working capital can also be managed. Right, so this is how working capital moves. Now you start with cash or you can go around or it can even be the other way. You can start at any point, but it is always a cycle. Right? Let's say you started with cash, you sold on credit, uh, you, you bought on credit, you bought uh, inventory on credit, sorry. Right, so the inventory will be sold on credit to your debtors and the debtors will give you cash. Then the cash you can recycle. Okay, so this is how the typical working capital cycle works. You have debtors, creditors, inventory, 
which goes in a cycle. That it's called the cash conversion cycle. That cycle that we just looked at is called the cash conversion cycle. It's a metric that expresses the length of time in days that it takes for a company to convert resource inputs into cash flows. Right. So for the, from the moment it purchases stock up to the time it is sold and cash is received, that time period is called the cash conversion cycle. So from end to end, from the time of purchasing inventory up to the time it is sold and cash is received from the customer. The cash conversion cycle attempts to measure the amount of time each net input of money is tied up in production and sales process before it is converted into cash to sales to customers. Cash conversion cycle is a combination of several active ratios involving accounts receivable, accounts payable, and inventory turnover. The ratios indicate how efficiently management is using short term assets and liabilities to generate cash. Right. So I hope you go through this. To calculate cash conversion cycle, you need several items from the financial statements. You need cost of goods sold, revenue from the income statement, inventory at the beginning and end of the period from the balance sheet, accounts payable and receivable at the beginning and end of the balance, period, balance sheet dates. Then the number of days in that period, right, or the quarter. So on the inventory management, the first thing we are going to cover is called days inventory outstanding. Right. Days inventory outstanding addresses, uh, it means it is a measure of how long it takes for, uh, for a company, for an organization to, from the point of purchasing inventory, for it to be sold. How long does it last in inventory? This addresses the question of how many days it takes to sell the entire inventory. The smaller the number, the better. Very important point. The smaller this number, the better. And that means you're holding it for a short period of time. Now, if there were two identical companies, one had the day's inventory outstanding of 500, the other one had the day's inventory outstanding of 50, then obviously the first company is much better because they are selling their products much faster than the other one. Right. So this is how you calculate. This inventory outstanding is average inventory. Remember average inventory, that means the, the beginning inventory plus closing divided by two, divided by cost of goods sold per day. Day sales outstanding looks at the number of days needed uh, to collect on sales and involves accounts receivable. Right. So what you sold, sell on credit, how long do you take to recover this? Well, cash only sales have days sales outstanding of zero. People do use credit extended by the company. So this number will be positive. Again, smaller the better. Right. So remember. Uh, Unlike some things, the smaller the better when it comes to some of the ratios. And there are other things where bigger the better become is best. But here smaller the better. 
So base sales outstanding is average receivables divided by the revenue per day. Remember, it is average receivables. So that's base sales outstanding. When you sell, you receive divided by revenue per day. Base payable outstanding involves the company's payment of its own bills or accounts payable. If this can be maximized, the company's hold on to cash longer, maximizes investment potential. Therefore, longer base payable outstanding is better. Base payable outstanding is average payable divided by cost of goods sold per day. Average accounts payable beginning plus ending divided by 2. All right, so let's do this calculation. Let's try this example. Base inventory outstanding is the average inventory divided by the cost of goods sold per day. So it's 8 million.
is 91.1. Base inventory of Stanley is 91 days. Now, what does this mean? Base inventory of Stanley is 91 days. What does it mean? It means that an item of inventory when purchased remains for 91 days. That you are holding on to inventory for 91 days. That's about three months. If you are recommending something to improve efficiency, perhaps well, you can say that uh, the 91 days should be reduced so that you can save on holding cost. So next one is the base sales outstanding average sales. This says outstanding average receivables divided by premium into average receivables six five seven twenty four divided by the revenue today is ten million. For twenty four days. And how you can interpret this? It takes twenty. You are giving twenty four days of credit to your debtors. This payable outstanding is average payables divided by the cost of goods sold. Is sixty five. And average payable. Cost of goods sold eight million. Okay. Well, did all of you get these answers? Cash conversion cycle. Is the base sales outstanding, this payable outstanding, uh, sorry, base sales outstanding plus this inventory outstanding uh, minus base payable outstanding gives you cash conversion cycle. So let's calculate cash conversion cycle for this. Cash conversion cycle, so this inventory outstanding plus this sales outstanding minus this payable outstanding. Inventory outstanding 
21, sales outstanding is 24, and in case payable outstanding is 30. Right, so looking at this, uh, sorry, this paper also and when you interpret, it means you, you get that it is a credit from your creditors. You can take that it is to settle your creditors. Now, this cash conversion cycle of 85 days means from the time of purchasing inventory up to the time you sell it and get cash, it takes you 85 days, good 85 days. So you are effectively out of money for 85 days. 85 days of credit you need. Right, because from the time of purchasing inventory. Up to the time you collect cash, it takes you 85, good 85 days. For 85 days, you need to survive. If you don't have 85 days of credit, you are going to die. You will be dead. Right? As good as dead. That's 85 days. Right, so the next thing is to try and figure out how to fund 85 days of credit. That is what you need to find. Right, so your suggestions for improvements can be to reduce the cash conversion cycle from 85 we need to 50. Because the lower the cash conversion cycle, the better. That means you are, you are churning faster. OK. Right, so working capital trade-off, accounts receivable, having high levels of accounts receivable, your customers will be delighted, satisfied, happy customers, your sales will increase. Right, that means you're giving more credit to your customers. No? Now imagine in your case, if you have credit card options, one will give you 30 days credit, other one will give you six months credit. You will obviously prefer the longer credit period, right? Because that Way you'll be paying later only. So you'll be happy to get additional credit. Your customers will be happy as a result. Your sales will boom. But it is an expensive option. And you'll have to fund high collection cost. You'll have to run behind your customers to collect. It increases financing cost. Then if your accounts receivable uh, this sales outstanding is less, your customers will be dissatisfied, sales will be less, but it's less expensive to you. Then accounts payable and accruals. If you negotiate for longer credit period, your supplies will be a little disappointed, but you're not, you don't have to pay immediately. So you'll be not stuck for cash. Reduces the need for external finance using a spontaneous financing source. Your supplies will be unhappy. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have low levels, your supplies will be happy. And uh, cost will be pretty high. Right. Current assets, having high level of current assets against low level of current assets, profitability will be lower. Because you have uh, assets which are giving you a lower return. More assets which are giving lower return. So your profit will be lower. And your risk will be also lower. Because you will never run out of stock. Uh, but if you have low levels of current assets, your profit will be high. Risk is also high. right? So it's high risk, high return. Then working capital financing policies. You can have three different approaches. Moderate, aggressive or conservative. Moderate means you match maturity of assets with maturity of financing. Right? So maturity is matched with maturity. Now, for example, in this one, you need 85 days of credit, right? So you go for a, for a bank and ask for three months credit, almost 85 days. Aggressive, you use short-term financing to fund fixed assets. So if you're aggressive, you're using so short-term funding to buy fixed assets, right? You buy land using a bank overdraft. Conservative, use long term capital like equity for fixed assets and current assets. If you are very conservative, you don't want to take a chance, you use long term assets to invest both in fixed assets and current assets. 
now in moderate funding policies right moderate financing policies you are trying to match your uh, your working capital requirement with similar to our loans right long term funds will uh, be funded from long term capital long term financing needs will be funded through long term capital short term fund financing need to short term capital temporary working capital requirements will be there if you are conservative everything is funded through long term stocks and bonds right almost zero debt levels the advantages of zero uh, short term versus long term debt short term it's usually low cost the cost for say 3 months is less than the cost for 5 years you can get funds very easily no uh, temporary old draft will be approved fast right or credit card loan easy to get funds whereas equity it will take years for you to raise equity you can repay short term debt without penalties disadvantages of short term versus long term short term you are not guaranteed you don't have the assurance that it will get rolled over high risk the required repayment comes quicker and the company may have trouble rolling over loans right so with that we come to the conclusion any questions from today right, if there are no questions we can wind up and i will see you next week Thank you and have a safe week.